okay. Welcome to day two of Fire Slayers Week. Today we're going to be talking about the resource that kind of drives the entire race religion of the Fire Slayers, and that is Urgold. We touched on it yesterday a little bit, talking about the fate of the god Grimnir, but I want to talk about kind of its implications for what it means in the faction. This is really a resource that is faction defining. There are no other factions in AOS that are driven to a attain a specific item, right? A specific resource. Usually it's lands, territory, freedom, control, you know, uh, slavery, all the things they want to impose on others. But there's not really anything else except for maybe Cadran overlords who are solely devoted to attaining a resource in the mortal realms. And so that is what we're going to talk about now. So to quickly sum up, we're going to talk about what is Urgold. Well, when Grimnir clashed with Volcatrix, he shattered. And his essence, Grimnir's essence, the power of a god, shot across the realms and landed into gold. Now, we're not sure if it's like he broke apart into actual gold, like his, that's what his body was made of kind of thing. Or if it's just the essence of his power was shot everywhere and infused into gold-like substances across the mortal realms. My wager is that it was his power that shot across and then because there's like actual veins of Urgold much like there would be veins of gold in the mortal realm. So my thinking is that his power kind of just saturated everywhere. And early on the Fire Slayers found this Urgold and they could sense a connection with their god whenever they were near it. They knew it had something to do with Grimnir but they weren't sure how and so they did what Duarden would probably do, which is they made weapons and armor out of it. And while these things were amazing, you know, they're fantastic craftsmen, it wasn't giving them really... It was kind of just the smallest ounce of his power. Then some smithy made a symbol of Grimnir out of it, and he became the first, as we know them now, Rune Master. And it makes sense, you know, you, you sense a connection to your god through this material. Eventually someone was going to make a religious symbol or iconography out of it and in doing so it unlocked a ton more power from Grimnir from these kinds of resources. It immediately made the bearer of this rune stronger and as they were fighting the rune would kind of burn white hot and burn its way into the flesh of the wielder. Eventually over time they kept crafting and researching ways to use this new material and they made smaller rooms that were basically just grafted straight into the skin. They light up, they glow red hot when battle is present and they just invigorate the warriors to new heights of slaughter. Now as a resource it's important to know kind of more things about Urgold. One is that it is a finite resource in two senses. Grimnir split into a finite number of bits, which means that there is a hard cap on how much Urgold actually exists. In addition to that sense, there's also the one that each piece of Urgold has limited power within it. When you make a rune, infuse it to your skin, and you get all the juice that you can out of it, and I'm assuming these things don't just burn out once per battle, they have to have some kind of longevity, but when they do run out of, we'll say, energy or power, they just pretty much resort back to being normal gold, which is why I think that it's more just Grimnir's power infusing to regular gold rather than it's a different resource. But to maintain that level of power of battle ferocity, Fire Slayers must replenish her gold. Take a rune out, put a new one in. And when you run out of power in your runes, it leaves a Fire Slayer craving more. They feel weak, they feel vulnerable. And now this creates some pretty interesting scenarios. There are tales of Fire Slayers going mad from too much Urgold. You infuse too much of yourself. On one hand, you could just literally explode. There are uh, histories of Fire Slayers literally exploding because they can't handle that much. Uh, but then there is the entire Berserker type of unit where it's a solo guy who just digs like dozens of runes into his body and goes absolutely wild and he's no longer fit to lead he's just kind of there to be a wrecking ball there are even stories of fire slayers when they go kind of crazy they'll start killing their kin to take the urgold off their bodies it really leads down some pretty dark paths when you take too much of this stuff and really what this comes down to is the discipline of the rune masters to divvy out Urgold. When the batteries run low on some warriors, they are in charge of replenishing it. And really their role is to make sure no one gets too much and no one runs out of fuel. And it's going to be a difficult job because some of these warriors can have different tolerances to Urgold as well as different needs based on their battle prowess, how much they can handle, what they can really accomplish with it. So being a rune master is very important and probably very technical. Now that's really all the lore there is about Urgold. It's literally just the essence of the god shattered apart and people use it in various ways to kind of attain his power. But there's a lot of implications here 
Typically in my videos I always say, why is this cool? But there, man, there's so much here that we have to discuss. The big one is, what happens when they use up all the ear gold? The battle tome doesn't actually say. Uh, is this the essence of Grimnir? Does he die? Like, is his essence spent? And we're just kind of incrementally taking apart a god? Well, we don't really think gods die. Uh, at least that's the sense we've always been getting. Or, does every time they use a piece of Urgold, like spend its power, it's releasing Grimnir kind of back into the ether. And eventually, when all the Urgold has been spent, uh, he will be able to reform into his old being. Now, it's never said, but I lean towards the fact that this releases him simply because I don't think they would do anything to kill their own god. But think about this for a second, okay? What if you had a society and a religion built around a combat drug, right? A, a sensory and physical performance enhancing drug with real negative side effects. What would that society look like? Because here's the thing, they're necessary to the war effort. It helped them survive the age of chaos, and it defines every aspect of their culture, and it's their only collective pursuit. It's what all Fire Slayers are doing. They could be out helping Stormcast Eternals, and that might be their mission, but there's always that secret mission of actually getting Grimnir back. But all those things have a cost. Because functionally what you get is it's like being on a hamster wheel. You put your first piece of Urgold in, you start moving, but you can't really slow down. You can't really stop. It just keeps going. You can't run out of fuel. You always need more. You get more Urgold and you're better and you want more battle. To fight in those battles, you need more Urgold. And you can see how the cycle continues. When you're out of it, you crave it. If you take too much of it, you go ballistic. The course of the society is to ensure that everyone has sort of a healthy fix, so to speak. And it puts them in a very dubious position. Because there's a lot of instances throughout this book where it makes them seem like mercenaries for hire. For example, there's a story of a order fortress that had paid the Fire Slayers to defend them against chaos. They did so. Fire Slayers say, okay, pay up. And the order guys say, oh, we're not paying you. There's another warband coming. We'll pay you after that. And basically kind of dishonor the contract that they had made. And the Fire Slayers just let Chaos invade and destroy everybody. So it's not a very good, noble thing, because it was all about the money, or Urgold as we know it. And there's even stories of them working for Chaos Lords, things like that, for Urgold, because it's easier to work for the Chaos guys than it is to just destroy them outright. This was actually a source of contention when the Battle Tome was first being released. People remembered the Dwarden being very honorable, Dwarves being honorable in Warhammer Fantasy Battles, and they kind of perceived that to be uh, a change in lore that was not favorable, right? That they're taking away this honorable aspect. And I think it's there. I just think that the honor code of restoring Grimnir to his glory so supersedes the small contracts that you take to get him there. So I, I don't think it destroys that sense of honor, but it is certainly different, and it does provide an avenue for them to be in some very not good looking positions. Now, one of the things I've loved about AOS is how order doesn't mean good. And so you get these factions with competing motives and desires and missions and subplots. When you put them all together, Fire Slayers can very easily look like bad guys who are essentially drug addicts by anyone else's standard and be in some really nasty positions that would have them fight against other order armies. On the other hand, they are an honorable race. They are a part of the Order army structure. They are fundamentally part of the Pantheon, because Grimnir was. And they're good guys, and so I love the duality of that. Urgold also presents some recipes for disaster, which makes great narrative fodder. Because what you functionally have is an aggressive, insular group with a single focus, a society built around a semi-rare and finite resource, trying to work with Order, who is kind of an all hands on deck for the greater good thing. And when you combine those two worldviews, you have you have very clear friction, right? And the minute the Order armies interfere with your really main pursuit of attaining and using Urgold, that alliance is over. It's just done. There's no question. And so that kind of duality of like being a good guy but having this kind of secret agenda, but it's not really a secret. They know what they're after. Everyone kind of knows and kind of keeps the Fire Slayers at half arm's length. You know, we all know this, and it takes a faction that could have been very bland of just a, a Slayer-themed dwarf army from, you know, kind of coming from Warhammer Fantasy Battles to now. They could have been very bland, where they're just kind of yelling all about vengeance, and turns them into something that has a lot of depth, that they can be in really cool narrative positions uh, and, and, and still drive events for good guys in the narrative, and I love that. So friends, what do you think about Urgold? Do you see it the same way I do? Do you have uh, narratives that you've created based upon the kind of awkward and, and somewhat negative positions that this resource can put you in? Leave it in the comments down below. 
We're chugging along with Fire Slayers Week, and tomorrow we're going to be talking about the various lodges throughout the realms, how they're structured and what they look like in each realm. But if you have an Age of Sigmar lore question you'd like answered, go ahead, click subscribe, and leave it in the comments down below. I try to respond to almost every single comment, and I use all of them as inspiration for future videos. And I look forward to seeing you in tomorrow's video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and happy wargaming.